Good afternoon and thank you for joining me for another Leadership Rounds. I'm Dr. Mindy Estes, President and CEO of St. Luke's Health System in Kansas City and Board Chair of the American Hospital Association. This week, I'm pleased to introduce Sarah Crevins, President and CEO of Sutter Health in Northern California. Sarah was named Sutter Health's President and CEO in January of 2016 after serving as Sutter's Chief Operating Officer. Before joining Sutter, Sarah held executive roles at Kaiser Permanente and served as Deputy Director of Maine's Bureau of Medical Services and Acting Director of Medicaid Health Planning and Licensure Programs. Headquartered in Sacramento, Sutter Health is comprised of an integrated network of 14,000 clinicians, 24 hospitals, outpatient services, research facilities, and home health and hospice care, and serves more than 3 million residents. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you. Very nice to see you virtually. It's good to see you. Thanks for being here. So let's just jump right into this if we might. So COVID-19 has certainly challenged our nation and our healthcare system, but it's also prompted us to explore new opportunities, allowing us to think about the ways we deliver care and the ways our patients access it. Um, are there any new strategies or innovations that Sutter's employed to not only fight the virus, but also to help improve care for our patients? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think almost every setting that I'm in, we're, we're talking about uh, where is the silver lining in this very big cloud that sits over our country. And it can be hard on most days actually to, to think about a life post pandemic, but it is good to think about what have we learned during this pandemic that's gonna help us in the future. And I think uh, what comes to mind first and foremost, probably for me and, and many other CEOs you're talking to, maybe for you as well, is the promise of virtual care. Before the pandemic at Sutter Health, we had a dedicated team of people who'd been piloting and on a small scale basis doing telehealth. We actually had a small virtual first clinic uh, that we had up and running, but we were doing 25 to 30 video visits a day. Within a matter of weeks, we were doing over 6,000 a day. And so what is remarkable about that is, of course, it's not about the technology. The technology was there all along. It's about what happened culturally and what happened in terms of the pace of change. We went from a small handful of physicians who did video visits to almost every clinician in the system. And I think about what does that mean for an integrated healthcare system? Where one of the challenges I think in our country is the spread of best practice. It shows that when people really have to do it, our clinical teams and our support teams can work together and make it happen overnight. So it is wonderful that in a safe way, we've been able to deliver virtual care to so many patients, but it's also wonderful, I think, to think about how you rapidly can deploy a change in clinical practice and a change in operating procedures across so many locations in order to help patients who otherwise couldn't get care. You know, we saw the same, the same uh, uh, phenomenon, but I, follow up question, how do you make it stick? Because once we had a little lull, our visits came back down. Now they're coming right back up. Yeah, so, you know, I uh, have the privilege of sitting on the governor's task force uh, here in California, and I and two of my colleagues, one, a clinical colleague and a colleague in innovation, wrote a white paper for that task force on virtual care and what were the reasons that made it stick. And I think we had this self-reinforcing cycle. So before the pandemic, physicians weren't as sure the care was as good and as safe for patients. Patients weren't sure that they were getting the very best care. Was this an imitation of the real thing? And there was no reimbursement model. So what happened during the early days of the pandemic is we created this virtuous cycle where there was a business model because of the emergency regulations that were put in place. Physicians said, this is safer for the patient and safer for me. And the patient said, this is a way to get needed care without creating undue risk for myself and my family. And so one of the things we have to do as leaders is think about how do we ensure that we understand where is the virtual care, the very best care, having our clinical teams tell us what's, which care is best to continue 
in this way post pandemic. And then we have to be sure that we have that virtuous cycle still in place. The business model, better for the clinician. It can't be an undue burden for the clinician, better for the patient. Yeah, well said. Not all or nothing. Not all or nothing. So safety is always a hot topic in yeah. our field and, and for good reason. And with COVID-19 upending so many of our practices and protocols, uh, we have to remain vigilant even more so about safety for our patients and for our teams at all times. So to that end, are there any new or particularly effective strategies that Sutter's employed during the pandemic uh, to ensure the health and safety of your teams? So uh, I think we're doing a lot of the same things that all responsible healthcare systems are doing. And I will tell you that during the early days of the pandemic, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the senior team thought about was how do we keep our employees and physicians safe so they can keep our patients safe? I mean, we had senior team meetings where we spent all of our time talking about supply chain and how do we ensure that we had the right supply chain. Um, like many other providers, we lost hundreds of millions of dollars during those months. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. I, I would do it all again, because the most important thing is keeping our people safe so they can keep our patients safe. But then once you get beyond that, and fortunately right now, and I'm knocking on my desk, um, you know, right now our, uh, our PPE is in good shape, our, our lab, our pharmacy, they're all doing a wonderful job. But the other thing you have to think about is staff morale and physician morale and well-being. And we had in place a, a partnership between our leadership in human resources and a clinical leader focused on well-being for clinicians and other staff. And we have kept that up during COVID. And actually we were gratified recently, we had our experience of work survey come back and we were gratified to see that those uh, marks on culture of safety did not go down. And actually in some places they went up. And one of the things I think that we did well is we were very transparent with staff about what we knew and didn't know. And as guidance kept changing, we just were transparent that we would change with the guidance. So it's, um, it's been a challenging time, I think, for all of us because the guidance has been ever changing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that transparency and that commitment that uh, we're gonna put your safety before anything that's happening uh, financially on a moment by moment or an hour to hour basis is the reason that um, you know, we have this amazing workforce that is, is with us and committed during this pandemic. Well, you know, transparent and authentic communication and lots of it certainly, uh, I think is a hallmark of what all of us needed to do and still do um, uh, as the pandemic certainly hasn't left us. And you, you alluded to this. I mean, the commitment of our caregivers has really been inspirational mm -hmm. uh, during this pandemic. And, but COVID fatigue really has set in. I think it's set in for yeah. everyone in healthcare. And I'm curious about your thoughts and, and practices about how we can better foster and support resilience among our, our caregivers. You, you talked about having a partnership with human resources, but uh, what have you done specifically to deal with, uh, with uh, resiliency and, and the rising COVID fatigue? Yeah, and I would say that um, the data on the impact that this is having on mental health and mental well-being for caregivers, for support staff, and for the general community, it, it's very real. Uh, you know, mental health is is under-recognized and under-treated on the very best day in this country, right? So many people who have uh, a, a mental illness are not getting the care that they need. There's a lot of stigma. There are a lot of barriers to getting care, economic barriers, access barriers. And then you bring COVID into it and people are isolated and you have uh, caregivers going to work. They may be the only person they know who's going into a workplace, or they may be one of a very few people who are going into a workplace. They worry about bringing disease back to their family their family may be very isolated. They've got children, they're trying to figure out how to educate through uh, Zoom school. It's very, very challenging. 
So what we did was really gear up some of the things we'd already been doing around mental health and mental well-being. We have a very active employee assistance program. We kept them both virtual and on site when needed during the pandemic. We have a number of uh, uh, community partners who do mental health, both in person and virtually. We geared up the virtual aspects of our community mental health partnership. And we didn't limit our support to our employees. We offered virtual uh, education and support for themselves, for their families. Uh, you could go onto our website and you could watch a, a podcast on parenting adolescents during uh, COVID. You could watch a podcast on dating during COVID, you know, things that really can support you in your day-to-day -day life as well as at work. And then at work, I think a lot of it is really making it okay to talk about it, to talk about the stress, to talk about the strain, making that available. And uh, the, sh the appreciation that our employees had for one another was phenomenal. The most, one of the most heartwarming stories that, that I heard, and I could tell you a million of them, we had a uh, nutritional services worker. So this is a support worker in nutritional services who had lost her home during one of the wildfires. And her facility had really wrapped a ton of support around her. And as an organization, we provided a lot of financial support as well. And uh, this nutritional services aid saw how hard the caregivers were working during the pandemic when her facility was so um, deeply hit. And she bought lunch for every caregiver in that facility. Wow. And that story spread like wildfire uh, through our bad analogy in California. It spread quickly <laughs> through our organization. Um, we had a facility in the Bay Area that drove um, chocolates and insoles and little gift bags up to the Central Valley when the Central Valley hospitals um, were had such a high census when, when COVID was very rampant in the Central Valley. So the formal support, the professional support matters, but I think that peer-to-peer -peer support has also been, been really amazing to see. Yeah, people have really stepped up caring for one another during this pandemic. Um, Finally, uh, the importance of proactive uh, communication. You know, we're seeing a surge across the country here in Kansas City right now. We have uh, a high watermark of COVID cases that we have had uh -huh. all year, and we are clearly going to be continuing to battle COVID, but we have flu to mm -hmm. just complicate and make it, make it more interesting. So how are you communicating with your patients and your communities about the importance of really following scientific guidelines around COVID, yeah. wearing masks, social distancing, and getting a flu shot? Yeah, so all great questions. Um, you know, here in California, uh, we have a county by county system for how, uh, how things are opened or closed. And uh, we have close to universal masking. So that's been very beneficial. You know, that's something certainly that follows the science. So we don't have some of the struggles that I think some states do where there may be more variation. So our variation is by county prevalence. And there's a, a system that's, that's pretty well understood. Now, adherence is where I think we all can be role models. And we talk to our employees about, you know, you can be role models at work and you can be role models at home. And, and that, that means that you're doing someone a favor. If you tell them the best way to wear a mask, the right way to wear a mask is over your mouth and your nose. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good thing. Uh, we have done a lot of communication uh, to our employees. We actually, for the first time, and you, know, you may already have been doing this, uh, our, our flu shots were always widely available, but now you can schedule one online because it used to be, you know, it was easy to drop in and wait in line. That's a little more difficult in the time of COVID. Uh, so we have tried to mimic getting those flu shots out in the community in ways that patients would feel safer getting them because they would know that it was in an uncrowded environment. Um, we've done a lot of interviews like this. We speak to business groups about the importance of encouraging 
masking, social distancing, uh, work from home when possible, hand washing and flu shots. So we're doing it everywhere we can. Uh, we try to do it in fun ways. We had a mask your pet uh, contest where people could send in pictures of their pets wearing masks and that we gave prizes. But the whole thing was to reinforce what's the proper way mm -hmm. to wear a mask and the improper way uh, to wear a mask. Um, you're right that we should all be concerned about what some label as the twindemic of, of flu and COVID, but we also could be encouraged. So here's another way to look at it. People get their flu shots, they wash their hands, they social distance, they wear masks. We could have much less flu in vulnerable populations than we have in certain years because people are gonna be more careful or we hope people are gonna be more careful. We're gonna encourage them to be more careful. Yeah, I'm, I, I must say I have an image of my dog, Sam, with a mask on now. Yeah, we'll send in the picture. We'll see if we can win a prize. There we go. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today and for sharing your insights on how we can learn from this pandemic that really helps us just advance health care uh, in, in our communities. So thank you to everyone for joining us today, and I hope you'll be back for our next Leadership Rounds conversation on December 3rd, when my guests will be Dr. Claire Zangerly of Allegheny Health Network. Until then, stay safe and be well. Thank you.